Lighthouse Church presents the following message by Pastor Jason Holloman. If you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs. Turn to the book of Proverbs. Uh, the book of Psalm is in the middle of the Bible, so you can just go right to the center. It's one of the largest books. And then the Proverbs is to the right. Is that right? I think that's right. It is to the right. Good. I, I got me really confused for just a bit there. If I'm confused, we're all in trouble. So, yeah, today we'll be in Proverbs chapter 16, and we'll see how far we get into uh, this proverb, but I'm excited to have the opportunity to begin to uh, share this proverb with you. Um, uh, any, uh, any artisans in here? Anybody, like, super into it, super into the art thing? Anybody? Like, okay, maybe I should make, okay, all right, we got, we got one guy who's super into it. Is there any craftsmen in here? Anybody in here a craftsman? Okay, all right. Yeah, so uh, anybody in here that, like, is a woodworker? Any woodworkers? Okay, awesome, great. So are, in, I'm assuming you're as good as, like, the old England kind of, you're not. Okay, great. Yeah, well, that, it, there goes the illustration. I, uh, uh, so I come from a long line of uh, uh, carpenters and men who are into building stuff, and, and none of them were uh, craftsmen in that way. They, none of them were into carving or anything like that. But I can tell you this, um, my, uh, I have lots of men uh, that are uh, both my dad and then other folks are, that are super into like carvings, right? So like European carvings. And, and so I grew up watching uh, all of the shows of the great carvers. Are you familiar with this idea, right? So you pull out all these different instruments and you're kind of carving into wood, whether it be relief or whatever the thing might be. And, uh, and then as I grew up, my dad would come in and spend all of his money and then money he didn't have on carvings. And so he would just come in with like these beautiful carvings. And he would say, do you see this? And I was like, oh man, it's amazing. He'd say, this was from a church in England at the turn of the century. And he's like, that's amazing. Why do we have it? <laughs> like, shouldn't it still be at the church? Like, seriously? Right? And he would always, and listen, my kids will attest to this. Um, it, he surrounds himself with car- masterpiece carvings all over the place. And so, man, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a church member of a couple of churches ago that was really into it. His name was Doug. And so he's like, hey, why don't you come out and why don't you practice carving with me? And I was like, you know what? I have been around carvings my whole life. I bet I'm naturally good at it, <laughs> right? Because that makes sense, right? It's kind of like being surrounded by a library. It just makes you smart, right, without having to read anything. No, it doesn't work this way? Okay. And so, uh, and so I just remember him handing me the sharpest tool that should never have been given to me, and then a piece of what he called soft wood, which basically just meant wood. And, uh, and so he did this little outline, and he kind of gave me a little kind of uh, just a, a little outline of what I was to build. And, and he said, hey, try to do, and I quote, try to, try to do a self-portrait. <laughs> it's like, because that seems better to do than, oh, I don't know, a dove or something super simple, right? And he's like, no, seriously, just envision yourself and just carve it in wood. And I remember thinking, this is a terrible idea. And uh, so I spent hours on this. And this guy, Doug, was t- taking me through some pointers. And, and so uh, what was Doug's wife's name, babe? Okay, th- we did not plan this before. <laughs> so anyway, sorry about that, babe. Yeah. Um, and so I walked in. I walked into Doug's. It's in Doug's garage. I walk into the house, and I said, and I, I said to her, I said, hey, <laughs> this is so true, it's horrible. I was like, hey, I, I, I'm finished with my carving. And I, I turn it around, and she says, oh, you carved a turtle. <laughs> it's like, no, it's my self-portrait. And she said, I am so sorry. I honestly thought you were trying to carve a turtle face. <laughs> it's like, that is the most, and so I didn't even bring that home. It, 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 I do not personally own that. It is, I, I put it straight into his trash can. I couldn't even throw it away in my own house out of, out of just sheer disrespect, right? And so, so listen, craftsmen are rare. I mean, really good craftsmen are rare. And the reason why I tell the story is because when we look at wisdom literature, when we look at wisdom literature, this is not just knowledge. So we're not just looking for like a guy like me who's surrounded by good carvings or surrounded by the knowledge of like, hey, that's Empire Revival or hey, that's turn of the century or whatever the thing might be. Hey, that's this wood or that's this wood. When the Bible talks about this idea of craftsmen and when you see the word for wisdom, it's the Hebrew word kohma. And it's basically saying, it's not just, hey, learn something. It's the idea of having intimate, practical, specific knowledge 
for what it is that you're doing. So it's not just, hey, look, I can tell you everything about carvings. It is that I personally, with these hands, have spent a lifetime putting this knowledge to practice. So I put here, it is, it is the, it's practiced skill. It's a, life of, it's a life of artistry. It's a life of practical wisdom, wisdom applied. And so when we talk about this idea from the Proverbs, wisdom, we're not just talking about things you need to know. Friends, we live in an age where anything you ever want to know, you're going to find out. All you have to do is just type it in. In fact, it's kind of, it's fun to watch groups of people and they're like, well, you know, because this happened at such and such date. It's like, no, it didn't. It's like, we'll look it up. We, we live in an age where you can look up everything. And I mean, immediately, I don't even have to type it into my thing anymore. I just say, hey, Siri. Uh, actually, I need to be careful here. I just, I just say, hey, hey, the name sh- that we shouldn't say. Oh, we totally did. That's so funny. Um, we, we say the thing that we shouldn't say, right? And, and, then, and then immediately we have knowledge at our fingertips. The second that we, that we want to know something, we just immediately find it. But this concept, this idea of wisdom is so much more, is so much broader than that. It's practical artistry wisdom. So when you look at a person who kind of looks like they win at life, they just kind of walk through life with wisdom. This is what the Proverbs are. And so if you look at the Proverbs, there's 31 Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. The hardest thing, in fact, uh, one of the elders and I were talking about this this morning, one of the hardest deals, one of the hardest realities of preaching the Proverbs is to communicate that they're not promises. This is really, really difficult. It would be like me saying, hey guys, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And then you come back and say, I've been doing that and my doctor's visit was bad. And it's like, well, it's a principle. It's not a promise. You see the difference? It's a principle, it's not a promise. And so there's this idea where we read and we want it to be 100% true of us all the time, like an apple a day keeps the doctor away. We would hope that that be true, but the principle remains true, though it's not a promise. It's also not a law. This is not like a decree of God's law. So in the Ten Commandments where it says, thou shalt not murder, this, this, is not, this is a principle, it's not a law. So it's not a promise, it's not a law, it's a, wait for it, it's a proverb, which is distinct from both. Now, if you look here at Proverbs 16, we're going to see what we can do about going from verses 1 through 9. Proverbs 16, beginning in verses 1 through 9. The Bible reads this in Proverbs chapter 16. The plans of the heart belong to man, but an, the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Now, if you look at verses one, two, three, all the way to verses nine, you'll see that the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord is in each of these verses except for verse eight. And so very quickly, you see this this separation between two things. You see the separation of the Lord and the ways of the Lord, the wisdom of the Lord, and then you see the separation of the heart of man, the wisdom of man, the tongue of man, or the speech of man, and then the way of man. You begin to see very quickly the separation, and they are not, they're not connected. They don't overlap. There is a way of the Lord, and then there is the way of man. And this is the construction of Psalm, excuse me, of Proverbs 16, 1 through 9. Now, if you continue, uh, verses 10 through 15, this is the way of a leader. So if you're a leader in here and you want to be a good leader, Good leaders look to Proverbs 16, 10 through 15. And that's the way of leaders. And so, but we're gonna stick with our time today with Proverbs 1, verses 1 through 9. Verses 2. Ah, this is important. And I, I failed to mention this. Something that happens in culture today. Now, listen, uh, anybody, okay, so who in the room is under 20? Raise your hand. Anybody in the room under 20? Under 20, under 20. Okay, man, we've got a good group of under 20. That's great. That's awesome. How many in the room feel like they're under 20, but they're certainly not? Okay, good. Okay, great. That's wonderful. That's good. Yeah, so there's a good, there's, it's a good group of youthfulness in here. And uh, how many of you feel like you're just old? Anybody in here? Oh, gosh. There's more of you than anything. Okay, great. Yeah, which is weird because there's some 20-year-olds in here that think they're old. So that's good. We're going to have to figure that out later. Very didactic. No, so this is an important concept here. Uh, the Proverbs do something that is really helpful in today's age, in particular today's culture. And that is, in today's culture, everybody believes 
that they should be uh, the center of the universe, the center of uh, importance. And the Proverbs are very quick to distinguish. And what they bring into the Proverbs is awe. So when the Bible says the fear of the Lord, it's not that we're trying to get you to be afraid of God or afraid of Jesus. No, no, it's not fear in the sense of like, ooh, I think that guy's gonna punch me. It's fear in the sense that he is unlike us. He is God. There is awe there. In fact, probably the most grand distinction of a Christian worldview and the cultural worldview that is quickly gaining steam and has been with us for a long time is that I can choose what I want on my time. I can do what I want to do. And the Proverbs is very clear to say, that's not true. That's not true. And though you might think it's right, it's not true. And so that's a big concept of what we're coming into with Proverbs verses one through nine. Verses two, all the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Hey, is this not so true? Is this not true? Is it not so funny that like if you've just spent time with folks that, that might not be into the Christian worldview or into the things of God, like they, they, those people, find that everything that they do or all the things that they desire or want are absolutely right. In fact, the concept of my truth is about to, I'm about to lose my mind over it. It's like, well, that's just my truth. If I, if I share Jesus one more time with one more person and they say, well, listen, I'm so glad you believe that. That's so good for you. I'm so thankful that you are super into that. And to which I say, I am super into it. That's true. What are you into? And you wait for it. It's always some variation of this. I'm just into the things I'm into. And it's like, yes, but what is it? It's like, whatever I want to be into. To which I say, you don't have truth. There is just what is true, and then there is what you think. Verse three. Uh, by the way, if uh, for those of you that are, so we are reading out of the ESV, the English Standard Version. It's just uh, what I think is a very helpful version of the scriptures. There are other helpful versions of the scriptures. A paraphrase version, a paraphrase version by Eugene Peterson called The Message, not great to study from, but great to use in study. He says of this, um, where it comes to uh, the tongue is from the Lord, he writes, uh, the plans of heart belong to man, but God has the last word. I thought that was a fun translation. In verse two, uh, he says, "God." so when ESV says, but the Lord weighs the spirit, the message says, but God probes For what's good. Verse three commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. Verse four and the Lord made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. What you're beginning to see and what's beginning to come to the surface is this idea of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. And so this is one of those concepts that if, if you've studied the scriptures for any length of time, you'll know that, that theologians, people that study the Bible, um, uh, Bible teachers have been struggling with this idea of the connection between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. That is to say, like, we get it. God's in, in charge of everything. God knows everything. He does everything. We get it. We get it. He's a God-centered God. He who is in heaven does whatever pleases him. Yes, so what do we do? And there's just this point where it, it, it feels like they are in conflict. One of my favorite quotes, in fact, in our membership class this morning, I, I quoted the quote because it's a, a favorite of mine. But Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a famous preacher, said that, uh, that he, doesn't have to, uh, he doesn't have to separate those two. He's like, I don't have to reconcile that. You don't have to reconcile good friends. Those are good friends. So I don't have to see that they're in They're in combat with each other, the idea of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Uh, A Bible teacher that taught me for years and years and years at my alma mater, uh, Dr. Stanley Toussaint, would say that um, if you want to to see the connection between God's sovereignty, the things that God reigns and rules in, the things that he controls, and human responsibility, the things that we uh, wake up in the morning and do and the directions that we take, if you want to see where the pitch of that roof intersects, 
then you're going to have to wait till heaven because it goes far. You could run around the house and you could look all the way up and you can read passage after passage after passage and see all of these passages talking about the, the divine sovereignty of God. And you can go all the way up to the, to the sky. And then you can run around to the other side of the house and look up the other pitch of the roof and see human responsibility and where they intersect. They're not in conflict. They're friends. And we're not going to settle it in this age. It'll require divine uh, efforts for us to see those things. So why do we mention this? Because this passage pulls apart what God does and what we do. You'll see this here. The Lord every, made everything for its purpose, even the, day, the wicked for the day of trouble. Now, verse five, everyone who is arrogant in heart or prideful is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. And this concept is, is not even an old covenant concept. This is important. So um, I can quote for you if you're looking at this and thinking, yes, but I thought that we are in a covenant of love and we have a covenant of grace. Oh, certainly we are, yes. And pride still does not go unpunished. Well, how would you say that? This picks up an argument that Paul has in 1 Corinthians 4, where he said, do you want from me a spirit of gentleness or do you want from me when I come the rod? People were, were arguing about this concept of, of who to follow and, and what different things related to the apostles they should follow. And Paul is saying, why are you so arrogant? Quit being so prideful. Quit walking in such hubris. Do you want from me a spirit of love and grace or do you want the rod, the idea of the rod of discipline? And so there's, what you see in the Proverbs isn't in conflict with the covenant of grace. It's not in conflict. It isn't. It, it, what it is, is it, it continues for us to be able to see, and we'll see this later uh, in our proverb, but we have the opportunity to lean on the grace that is given to us in Jesus. Verse number seven, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. In fact, I wrote in my Bible to think that that's even possible with the Lord that those that are enemies before us, right, those that we are in conflict with, those that are difficult in our lives, that, that even God can, can change the heart of our enemies. Verse eight, better is a little with righteousness than with great revenues with injustice. And then verse nine is very similar to verse one. Verse nine, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Do you see the connection between responsibility of a person, right? You see here, the heart of man plans his way. He makes a plan. He puts his plans together. He, he begins the, the, to set out his course, but what happens? But the Lord establishes his steps. Do you see the, the two coming together once again? Now, here's two errors that happen in the life of Christians. Two errors. One, God is so involved in everything that I shouldn't even plan. That's one of the errors. It is an error. Uh, all throughout the scriptures, it is clear what it, as the Bible relates to good plans and making plans and being faithful and the responsibility of stewardship and, and healthy management and considering costs for construction and all those various things. We see that all through the scriptures. God is a God who wants his people to make plans. Praise God. An error is that people say, well, man, if God's gonna just do what he does, why do I even care? Because God wants us to partner with his plan. They are friends. They're not enemies. Sovereignty and responsibility are not enemies. They're friends. Now, here's another error that takes place. When people say, no, 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 I'm putting a plan together, and it doesn't matter what God thinks about it. That is another error. It's just on the opposite side. Where people say, no, I'm going to do exactly what I want to do, and nobody's going to stop me. Do you know people like this? Yeah, so to say that I'm gonna do whatever I wanna do and this is the plan that will happen forgets that there is a sovereign God, as verse nine says, establishes the steps. So what does a, wait for it, balanced Christian do? Everybody thinks they're balanced, right? I mean, you could be so off balance in some areas of your life and you come in and say, no, I'm super balanced. No, look at me, look how balanced my life is, right? 
Everybody thinks they're balanced. Everybody thinks they're in the center of whatever it is. I love to, to share with people, it's like, hey, this is what I think about it, and I'm way over here. Center is right here. This is where the normal people are. I'm way over here. And people just kind of scratch their heads because it's so odd for anybody to communicate that they're not balanced, right? And so here, what, what, what does a balanced Christian do? What does, a, what does a Christian do as it relates to making plans and trusting and accepting that the Lord establishes the steps? What do they do? Well, I'll tell you. We walk with great desire in planning with our hands opened to those plans changing. And for some of us, whoo, this is not easy. I mean, it's like ripping something that we hold tightly straight from our hands because we want so bad for the things we plan to be merited. We want so badly for the things we plant to grow exactly the way that we want. Now listen, I'm asking, is this true of you? I mean, do you look at your life and say, man, I just love my plans to change without me even knowing it. <laughs> Anybody in here? Anybody like, I'm so, I'm so laid back, I'm so easy going. I just love working super hard on very detailed plans just to watch them crumpled up and thrown out the window. Man, that is the way I wanna, I wanna spend my family vacation. Right? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, no? Mm -mm, no? Okay. Yeah, most of us, even if we're A-type or not A-type or whatever the thing is, most of us have an expectation that what we set in motion will be. Most of us kind of feel that way. Most of us want those things. And the Bible, again, our last verse for today, that the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Now, I've got three questions for you because this uh, passage, uh, this section of the Proverbs is intended, it's intended to be reflective because each of the Proverbs, remember, they're principles, not promises. They're principles, not laws. Each of these are intended to, to shape you and put a mirror before you to reveal if you or if I are walking in wisdom. That's what it's intending to do. It's like, hey, do you know what you think about this? And so here's the first question. So for those of you that want to get it, like are caring about this, that desire this, uh, I, there's one more passage that we're gonna read, and it's important. It's an important passage from Romans. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, at the end of, of asking these three questions, uh, in, in, a, in, a in a desire for you to feel this, I'm gonna read each of the verses again and quote this passage from Romans 8 to prove to you that God cares not just about your plans, but he cares about his plans more. That is not the way to grow a church. It's never a way to grow a church to say, you matter, you're amazing. You just don't matter as much as God does. Everybody loves what you think. You're wonderful. God's better. We want you to be so happy and comfortable, unless in any way you are uh, transgressing the law of God, and it's amazing. Yeah, not a good way to grow a church, is it? No. But God makes a way for his people. For those who love him, all things work together for good. Romans 8, the 28th verse. So, first question. Actually, before we go there, what time is it? Oh, Friends, you're in trouble. We've got time. We've got time. Now, for those of you that are first-time guests with us, I am so sorry. You will get to, you will get to lunch. You will. Matthew, uh, turn very quickly to Matthew 26. Let's go there. So we just celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. We just celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. Praise God, right? Um, in Matthew chapter 26, and we can start uh, in verse 36. But in Matthew 26, what we see here is Jesus struggling with this idea. So he is in the garden of Gethsemane, and in the garden, he is struggling with this idea. And so Jesus says, or excuse me, the, the Bible records this in verse 36. And then Jesus went to them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And talk with Peter and the sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said, my soul is very sorrowful, even to the point of death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, verse 39, he fell on his face 
saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Listen, this is Jesus struggling with divine sovereignty and his desire of plan. Now, and before you try to make this more, um, more spiritual than it is, when he says cup, he's not making some metaphor. He's not talking about uh, some kind of a random cup. He is talking about suffering. He is talking about suffering here. He's saying, Father, I don't want to suffer the direction that I am seeing that I'm going to suffer. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Now, you know one of the most wonderful things about this being, um, being captured for us by the disciples? One of the most wonderful things for Matthew to capture this narrative for us is because it proves to us that we are not uh, in sin struggling with and asking God about it. It's like, Lord, why, why is this my cup? Why is this my life? Why is this my lot? Why is it that you don't feel like you're answering here? Jesus himself is in conversation with his father and he is saying, I don't wanna suffer. I don't want to suffer, but not what I want, but what you want. Do you see it? So you make plans. We make plans. We, we should make plans. It's good. But those plans, whatever they might be, like I've got plans to have really great kids, but I got to open my hand for it. I got to open my hand, right? I have, I have plans for this church. The elders of the church have plans for this church. We're so excited about those plans. But man, we have to open our hand to whatever the Lord wills, in whatever category the Lord wills it. And we see this here in the life of Jesus. So I've got three questions for you. First question, what cup of suffering are you holding where you question the nearness of God? Like what what suffering in your life where you go, man, where is God with this being my life? Like where... What is it in your life? Do you have something? Do you have a circumstance? Do you have a a, a point of history? Do you have a a current relationship? What is it? And so what point of suffering, what cup is in your hand that causes you to question the nearness of God? For those who love God, all things work together for good. Romans 8, 28. Second question. What plans have you made that you are so frustrated that they did not come to pass? Did sickness change some things? Was there a part of your life as you look back and you think, this, I wish this was different? What plans did you put in place? What plans did you put in motion that you are just questioning the goodness of God in, in your life? The Bible says in Romans 8, once again, for those who love him, all things work together for good. All things. Not the really great things, all things. And then our last question, our last question. Where is a place where you question the goodness of God? So here's something that I hear often. Here's something I hear often. If God's good, why is God? blank present in my life? Why is blank present in my life? If God is good, why is blank not able to happen? If he's good, why is blank not here? Or if God is good, why is blank always here? For those of you wives that, you know, want to change it up a little bit, right? Why is he always here? If God's good, why is he always here? Why is he always here? Never leaves. No hobbies, just here. <laughs> too, too personal, too personal, too much. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's so fun. To see the, the, to, to see the women shaking their heads, oh, it's just, it's just a real gift of grace to me. So that's wonderful. That's really good. Oh man, can't hide that. That's great. If, uh, if the worship team would come up as we enter our time of the Lord's Supper, this is, uh, this is important. It's important. 
Proverbs 16 says this. It's really good to make plans. It's really good to put things in place. It's really good to consider these directions. Yeah. And I, am I oh, I'm, I'm back. Oh, you turned everything down. Guys, hey, listen. Hey, thankless job. Come on. Come on now. That's good. That's good. It's so good. And listen, I would have been so freaked out, I would have just slid everything up. Like, ah! Yeah. See, everybody has their own gifts, right? Everybody has their own gifts. Amen? Amen. Good. Yeah. And for those first-time guests that will never be back, thanks for giving us a shot. All right. Now, now we get back to the sacred part of the service. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, on that night, on the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he takes the bread. And uh, we just had a, a Seder, we just had a Easter, and we just had all of these fun festivities. And a part of that is, we talk about the idea that you break the bread, right? It's breaking uh, because there's no leaven. And so we got some crunchy bread. And so the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he takes the bread, he, he breaks it. And he looks at his disciples in Matthew chapter 26, and he says, take and eat my body broken for you. Church, let's remember. And in, in the same manner, he takes the cup. It would have been wine. And he takes the cup, and he passes it around to the disciples, and he says, take and drink. Uh, this is the cup of the new covenant. Oh, it's so wonderful. It is so wonderful that we are no longer under condemnation, those who believe in Jesus. Those that do not remain under condemnation. And so we can celebrate the new covenant, a covenant of grace and love. Praise God that we no longer have to, to find a little lamb somewhere and, and then slaughter it uh, in front of everybody because that just wouldn't work well today, right? It just wouldn't. It would, be, it would be a very violent death. And I'm not trying to oversell this. Jesus died a violent death to enter those who believe into a new covenant. Praise God. So take and drink. Father, as often as we gather, we do this in remembrance of you. And so, Father, we thank you for wisdom literature. We thank you that we can see in Matthew 26 just the anguish that you had going to the cross. We thank you that the idea of divine sovereignty and human responsibility, that it is so easily seen in the person of, of Jesus. And so, Holy Spirit, come. Would you open our eyes, open our ears? Would you open our hearts? Would you help us to see the prominence of your word, whether it be 1 Corinthians 4 and just those of us who walk in pride? Would you just, would you just diminish pride as a work of your spirit? Whether it be those of us who just want to control the plans that we have, we find it easy to say that you're not good. I cannot even imagine if it were one of us in the Garden of Gethsemane. Like, how easy would it be for us to think you are not good, but your son Jesus, who went to death, the entire moment unto his death, knew and believed and experienced you as good. Would you help us when we take the small plans of our own lives in our own steps, in our own uh, hopes, would you help us to see, Father, that, that you are good and you are present. We pray and ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. For more information, visit our website at lighthousentx.com.